and welcome to 11FS Spotlight. My name is David Brewer and I'm the CEO over at 11FS. As you guys know, in this show, we shine a bit of a spotlight on the best and the brightest to really understand what is it that gets them going, growing, and really what they think the future of the industry will, will look like. Uh, on today's show, uh, I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by, by Jim McCarthy, who is the Executive Vice President, Global Head of Product and Sales at Thread. I wanted to make sure I got that yeah, right. That's a, yeah. that's a great a job title there. Yeah. Uh, and we're here live in Amsterdam at Money 2020, which has been a hell of a show so far. Uh, great to have you on the show again. Uh, obviously, last time it was uh, a little bit more behind closed doors yep. we, we, uh, we met up. But uh, how's your 2020 experience so far? It's been great. Um, you know, it's kind, of, it's kind of an interesting experience because this is the largest space they've ever been in. So in some ways, it, it feels a little more intimate. On the other hand, though, I understand it's the largest crowd ever here at Money 2020 in wow. Europe. So, uh, so for all of the doom and gloom, uh, uh, you know, hard raising capital scenarios, it appears fintech is alive and well. Yeah, and and very much in the everybody's diary. You know, like it's uh, there's very few events globally that everybody puts in their diary and everybody flies in from wherever they are, right? Yeah. So it's uh, amazing to see everybody together. Bizarrely, I think I bumped into people that I know I work like 20 minutes away from in London, but. You never quite find the time, you know. So no, but, uh, this is a this is a unique experience here in Vegas, where not only do you get to meet you know your contemporaries, uh, your clients, potential clients, but it's it's like uh, you know an alumni fintech day where I see people that I've known for twenty years but haven't seen in you know ten. So it's great. Very good. Oh, well, today we're going to talk a little bit about your background, your career. You, I mean, you've, we were talking beforehand, and we've talked before. You've done some amazing things in your in your career, and and then actually the the future for Threads. You know, what are you guys doing? Where are you guys going? And and really, how are you uh, how are you looking to disrupt yep. the industry in terms of what you're doing? Maybe we start off uh, a little bit with um, actually for anybody who's not familiar with Threads. I mean, obviously, you guys have gone through a bit of a rebrand yep. recently, formerly known as GPS. Talk to me a little bit more about that. For those that don't know, you know, GPS is a uh, it defined just generally speaking as a modern uh, uh, issuer processor, debit uh, prepaid. So we fall into the category of the Marquettas, Galileos uh, of the world uh, that people will know. Uh, and GPS is was and is well in some ways the the power behind a lot of the UK fintech ecosystem. Yeah. So, so historically, we grew up behind you know powering the likes of Monzo, Starling, Revolut. Um, we, we've expanded uh, out of that. Uh, we, we stretch all the way to Japan with clients like Payday. We have signed Neom in uh, in Singapore and Hong Kong, large uh, uh, money movement platform. So we stretch now from Japan uh, through the UK and actually have a, a couple client relationships currently in Canada and the US. Our view is is that the the space, the the payment space in particular. I, I define payment much broader than issuer processing anymore. Because it's money in, money out. It continues to evolve. Um, and we see ourselves as, as being a key player in the future uh, of, of the evolution of, of payment processing. Yeah, you guys sort of consistently, uh, I think one of the humblest people in the industry, quite frankly, like you, as you say, a lot of people don't know, but you powered up basically the, the FinTech scene in early days and, and actually quietly went about doing that and built out the infrastructure to make that happen. It's, uh, it's a pretty decent track record, right? Yeah, no, look, like I said, there's a lot to be proud of uh, given, given the history and to your point, the fact that we were the invisible engine that, that powered the success of some of the largest brands in, in fintech. But, but that's why the Thread brand name is so important because it really is a recognition that, that we're part of the ecosystem, we're part of the fabric, if you will, uh, of the fintech ecosystem, not only in the UK, but now Europe, Middle East, uh, Asia, as well as hopefully more in the US. In the yeah. I mean, it, you've been in the industry for, for a while. I mean, payments is, uh, it, you know, almost it was the, the earliest, it was the tip of the spear when it came to, to fintech and the change yeah. that we've seen. But, but it's really come around again in terms of what it really means to be a payments provider in, you know, 2023 and beyond. So, yeah. I, I mean, is there different challenges today than there was before? Because, you know, you talk about the, the, that fabric, we talk about the, the fundamental fabric of financial services, that underpinning bit. But increasingly, payments are coming higher and higher in the stack, aren't yeah. they? It's not just the invisible rails. It's it's much more than that, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. You know, look, I, 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 I like to tend to think of it like in analogies. But, you know, payments has always been at the heart of commerce. But unfortunately, you know, as payments about matter of fact, I, I always argue Visa was the first fintech. If you define it as technology and finance going together, yeah. as soon as VisaNet was hatched, and, and in fact, it was called, matter, matter of fact, it was called uh, um, base one was Visa's authorization system. It stood for Bank of America Systems Experiment. You know, if you go back to the 60s and 70s when that happened, through to where we are today, it's been evolution of, of electron, electronifying payments and commerce. 
Historically, though, payments literally was the last thing you did as you checked out of a store. You know, I could think about my life growing up, you know, my mom pushing the shopping cart, you know, queuing in a line, unpacking the cart, you know, uh, running it through the till and then paying. Yeah. When e-commerce and the digitization all this stuff took off, Unfortunately, the world just, just they didn't re-engineer that process. The vast majority of people just copied it. So, yeah. so instead it was a digital queue, you know, digital shopping cart, you know, digital checkout and the digital payment. Yeah, I, I like to talk about Amazon was the first to really re-engineer it with one click. And as we sit here today, we're still evolving that. I mean, I'd argue that, you know, the, the payments and the way it's defined around card rails and RTP rails and wire rails is still broken because as consumers and businesses, you know, getting paid and paying is the heart of what we all do. Yeah. But historically, like I said, it was handed like as a one-off. So as we sit here today and look at the businesses around here, I think we continue to evolve towards a world where, as you call it, payments is higher. I was realized earlier in the conversation, realized, you know, and, and, and I, I love the embedded finance concept just because payments has always been embedded. It's just the, the, the ease of use, the ability to do more, do it with more um, uh, transparency, uh, you know, understanding pricing and, and what you're getting for what you're paying in terms of payments it, it is all evolving and getting better. So, so there's a lot more to come in this space. Yeah, I mean, it's fascinating, isn't it? As you say, the how many industries the the conceptualization of what ends up being done is because of the previous form factors understanding. As you say, Absolutely. the shopping cart or the you know the grocery store or whatever. It's it's amazing how we we almost building those inhibitors just by how we process things, which is bizarre. But it's um it's almost a it's an interesting inhibitor. But I mean I, I guess with that change though, and you know with um, you know moving money and the the services you can build around that more broadly. I mean uh, you guys have obviously I mean you've got a great booth here, but have you walked the floor? Are you are you seeing that sort of being reflected in the the conference today? A little bit. You know it, it's really kind of funny the. Uh, the world likes to copy things. And so if you were here a couple of years ago, it's probably banking as a service. You know, obviously BNPL was the, the big topic. Um, you know, now you're seeing more of the payouts businesses, um, you know, multi-currency businesses. You know, I, I'd argue again that the world is flat. Um, regulators make it tough to live like that. But, but what you're seeing is people kind of cluster around these ideas. And I'm still, people are missing the abstract of this is what you were getting at, which is step back from it and it's, it's about money movement, paying in, paying out. And I don't think anyone's really kind of still figured that out yet. You got folks like Checkout.com beginning to start to move into issuing. Adyen, a little bit into issuing. Uh, Stripe, a little bit into issuing. Everyone's kind of on a journey at this point. And people again like to do the payout stuff as well. I mean, obviously Visa Direct and MasterCard Send are big initiatives. But no one's plumbed it end to end in a way that's very easy to consume. It's still very a lot of very niche players. Yeah. But I think the journey we're headed to is that one where there'll be more abstraction, more ease of use to, to consume any rail and do it on a global basis. It's just, we're on that journey, no one's done it yet. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? When, uh, and obviously, I mean, your background, you know, before Thread, you've been at Visa for, for quite a long time. And it's amazing to have been in the industry for a while and see all of these things directionally in a, uh, a movement towards a, a very different place. I mean, the industry must have changed quite dramatically over that period. And, you know, we talked a little bit before about, you know, different things that you did at, at Visa yeah. as well. I mean, it, it's a, a real privilege to have been part of an industry that's changed so dramatically, right? I always kind of think conferences maybe like 30 years ago must have been really boring because nothing was happening, but well, that's not the truth, is it? You know? No, it was kind of funny. The big things then were like retail banking yeah. conferences, but uh, it's wild to think how payments, like to your point earlier, is now at the heart of the discussion, that it's payments where the money is. If you go back in, when I started at Visa, there, most banks didn't have a payments P&L. They barely had a, a group that focused on payments. You had the debit folks that were still thinking about debit as a check replacement, not a revenue engine or, or a relationship engine. Yeah. So, so that journey still continues. I, I'll tell you my first job, um, I'm, not so, I'm not sure I'm proud of this anymore, but. I started at Visa and I ended up owning um, what, what became 3D Secure. And I can tell you, sitting last night uh, trying to buy tickets for my kids for Harry Styles, who was playing here, and having it fail because the 3D Secure window wasn't <laughs> popping. I'm like, man, it's 25 years I've been at this and it's still not working right. And, and to your point, identity is at the heart of payments, and yet yeah. these things are still happening. So, so there's still so much room for improvement. Um, but honestly, one of the big challenges the industry has is just pushing change through, even though we're we talk, talking like we're digital and we're API first and we're all modern, 
change takes a very long time in payments. And it's unfortunate because all the pieces are there, but no one's orchestrated them yet. It's still way too difficult to yeah. actually do commerce in a lot of cases. It's amazing, and, and your, your point there about change. I mean, uh, you know, we, we just said it's a shame that our previous form factors sometimes inhibit the, the current ones, but I mean, there's a good reason for that. You know, the, the change isn't just commercial as in businesses adopting it, it's, it's people, right? right? You know, so, um, I mean, obviously we've seen massive changes. I mean, most of us can walk out without our wallets now right. and still be able to do everything with our phones. I mean, uh, how much of, I guess, what you've done previously and what you've seen previously affects really the strategy you're gonna pursue with Thread because the, the opportunities there are reasonably yeah. endless in that sense, but yeah. often it's um, focus on the, the next three big things that really make the difference, isn't it? No, look, it's a great question. So, so I'm here uh, from some of the lessons I learned in my in history. One of the big ones was you know, the 2014 launch of Apple Pay, um, you know, Visa, MasterCard, uh, in collaboration with Apple and a, and, a, and a handful of the largest bank issuers in the U.S. Um, worked on that launch under under you know the cloak of darkness. And when we launched it 14 months later, it was the fastest launch that I've ever seen in, in my time before or since in, in the payments industry and done without very little industry involvement. And yet I was able to take my iPhone, you know, before Apple Pay was launched and go to Dubai and actually use it at a contactless terminal. And the lesson I learned there was the challenge that you have, and if you think about Visa MasterCard is really cloud providers because they can push things into their network very quickly. The challenge is how do you get that out into the market, the technology first, which still takes a long time. And then to your point, getting consumers and merchants to adopt it. It, it, it can become very daunting. And I remember on the back of Apple Pay, which was, which was revolutionary from a user experience perspective, I remember within months of the launch, people trying to ask me, has it been successful? It failed. It doesn't matter. They don't have great growth. And I'm like, no, because it takes a long time, even as quick as we were. But, but the, from a processing perspective, what I learned was issuer processing. Well, let me, let me step back. When we IPO'd in 2007, we were sitting in the room in, in San Francisco talking about, you know, how, where we could monetize uh, the network more. The place we would never touch was the merchant side, primarily because the merchant's piece of the business where good ideas went to die because the plumbing was horrendous. But as short as, as 2010, when Stripe and Square launched, the world changed. Yeah. And as we sit here today, right, the merchant piece of the business is completely transformed because of technology. But as we sit here today, the issuing side hasn't. I mean, uh, Visa will, you know, celebrate, you know, X number of contactless transactions in 2023 as, as an innovation. And, and I'm like, that's been around in Europe for how long? You know, Australia is primarily contactless, and yeah. yet that's the state of the art for issuer processing. So I, I'm a big believer that um, there's a lot of room to improve the delivery of services to consumers instead of cards, instead of phones. It's still too fractured, it's still too hard to do things, it's hard to do things cross border. So I'm here because that's where I think the, the next major wave of change is going to come is on this side of the house. Yeah, and it's amazing. I mean, in the the payment sense, uh, I mean, the regulator regulations. You know, you guys operating globally. You know, payments is you know very different as you you mentioned. You know, the yep. U.S. is very different to Europe. Is really different to Asia. The you know the 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 playing field, the rules of the game yeah. are very very different, and therefore the opportunities that you've yeah. got to serve customers is really different. I, I mean, how do you? sort of stay abreast of that, because that's a, that's a difficult challenge, right? Yeah, so, so two ways. Um, you know, partners like Visa and MasterCard are very important in that, they, because they sit across the globe. They have, they have a pretty good seat at the table. They're usually in the discussion. Um, secondly, you have people in the markets, because to your point, you know, every one of those markets is different, and clients have different needs, um, and regulators are creating different playing fields, so you've got to be in the market. So we've got people in all the markets we yeah. serve and are close to them. And it's truly really one of our differentiators. While, while the software, you know, as a service model is great, people still matter, you know, cultural and regulatory um, um, behaviors matter, so we've got to be there. So we sit across that. But, but to your point, I think the biggest challenge we have today collectively as an industry is the regulatory framework that continues to change and unfortunately, I think we're in a cycle where we're going to see more regulation, not less, which will constrain the, the fintech industry uh, writ large. Yeah, it's interesting. Some, uh, in some ways, it's a, uh, you know, big banks I've worked at in the past. There's gigantic regulatory programs to adhere to, you know, whatever PSD3 becomes or whatever. Yeah. You know, like, but then there's lots of organizations that look at opportunities of those things as well. I mean, it's a, uh, it's interesting. There's always that uh, yin to the yang or the yang to the yin yeah, in that no. way. 
I mean, look, you, Europe was a leader with, with you know, open banking and the, the, the purpose to make it easy for consumers and, and third parties to innovate and, and make kind of free the, the consumer from the shackles of you yeah. know, being you know, their bank account. And yet, um, as we sit here today, it feels like it's going, it's working back against itself, and it's more difficult than ever in some ways to, to innovate in the space. Yeah. And look, I'm, I'm not against um, regulation. I mean, at the end of the day, we're talking about products and services that that need compliance, and there's a lot of risk. I mean, look, look what happened with uh, with you know the real time products uh, in, in the UK and the the kind of the push payment fraud and the scams that appear. The sad part is the remedies oftentimes feel worse. Uh, you know, you get all you know in the U.S. They've threatened the banks to put you know put fire you know put walls up, and so all the benefits of being able to move money easily now feels like you know a lot of lot of owner stuff and being blocked from yeah. access to moving my money. So there's a balance there. Uh, unfortunately, oftentimes it feels like we're on a pendulum as opposed to having a really reasonable discussion in the first place. Yeah, it, it's an interesting one, isn't it? I think particularly in the payment space. I mean, there's the old saying is like, there's never a statue for a committee. Yeah. Uh, but actually payments is a, I mean, it's an interconnected network of networks. Do you know what I mean? There's, there's no way one organization can do something on their own. There's, there's got to be consensus. Yeah. You know, there's got to be a, uh, um, at least uh, uh, an, uh, you know multiple parties involved in it to to move those things yep. forwards. But but I guess I mean that's an interesting thing from a strategy perspective for you guys at Thread is you know often just sheer determination is what's going to make these things happen, isn't it? And doing that in a big organization is very different from doing it in a uh, you know I, I, I won't call you guys a startup because you're not. You're a really really established business. But it's a uh, it's a very different thing. How, how have you found that that transition in that? I, yeah. I imagine that must be something you've enjoyed. Oh, I love it. Um, I'll never you'll never hear me say like I, I miss all the meetings <laughs> uh, we had. That Please no, give me some more forms yeah. to fill in. Yeah. I had no decisions <laughs> getting made. Yeah. Um, yeah no, it, there, there's there's a, a certain freedom to being able to ask the question why freely. Challenge, uh, challenge the you know uh, things that are considered you know sacrosanct, and, and then innovating and, and actually doing it with your clients. I mean, providing capabilities and services. I don't need to come up with all the great ideas. I just need to provide a platform that allows our partners to innovate in their markets and serve their markets uniquely. And yeah. and again, you know, with clients like Trezor in France, it's very different than Payti, you know, in, in Japan, very different from uh, Zilch in the UK or Curve as an example. They all very different go-to-market models, but we power them all, and it's, uh, it's fun working with them, and, and, and hopefully, in some ways, helping them innovate and ser serve their clients. Yeah, amazing. What, what's, what's next for Thread, then? You've got, uh, you know, the, the market sort of, um, people always kind of look for market opportunities and growth opportunities. You know, the, the potential globally to, to keep expanding seems huge, and you know, cost, you're solving one customer problem and turning over new ones. Yeah. So, I mean, it feels like the opportunities is sort of endless. Yeah, look, I, I, as I said just a second ago, I don't want to constrain my clients with my capabilities. We have clients that want to go more deeper into the U.S. They want to go into LATAM, Brazil, Mexico. They, they want to go into Sub-Saharan Africa. So I've got, I've got to take what we do today and expand our ability, which means, to your point, you know, local market regulations, uh, sometimes local uh, schemes that you've got to connect to. So I want to give my clients the ability to do what they do today in more markets. So that, that's one big priority. Second is give them more choice, right? So I mentioned Visa and MasterCard are great partners, but there are other great partners yeah. uh, in the network space that we need to work with and connect to. So our clients, again, are not constrained. And, and then lastly is, is really deepen our capabilities in terms of uh, payment capabilities, both on the front end. You know, uh, tokens are very important and will continue to be white label mobile apps, digital experiences. So we're going to deepen our capabilities there. And same on the back end, right, to the point about compliance earlier, whether it's KYC, KYB, you know, AML capabilities, uh, identity capabilities, risk, fraud, disputes, chargebacks, all the things that are the hard lifts uh, we've got to do. And then the last, in my mind, the really big, the big idea, if you will, that no one that's modern has really solved at this point is creating a credit uh, product. Yes. Um, Credit's much more difficult than debit and prepaid. Um, the corner cases can kill you, compliance can kill you. But it's also a huge opportunity because the, the real providers, they are all legacy. 
and, and no one can move very quickly as a result. So, so credit is definitely a space that we think we want to occupy. It's amazing that point about moving quickly, how much that is a strategic advantage. You know, it's, uh, I mean, it's uh, rule number one of evolution, right? If you can adapt to the market and do things quicker than everybody yeah. else, you're probably likely to thrive in that yeah, sense. Yeah, no, change, change is inevitable. And so uh, I think those that handle it best are, will be the winners. And I, I need to say one of the things that really differentiates us is our ownership. I mean, we're privately held. We've got Advent and Viking and Tomasic as backers. And in this financial environment, you know, having people that, that are investing and willing to play the long game that, that share the same vision is really important. So I think that's one of our key differentiators. Yeah, definitely on it for the journey, which is amazing. Yeah, yeah. I, I guess um, maybe taking a, a step back then and, and you know, you're, you've had a great career, you're doing amazing things. People must have given you really interesting advice during it. I mean, what's the what's the one bit of advice that stands out from that's really sort of changed the way you think yeah. about the industry? There, there are two things. Um, one of my first bosses, the the, the guy that uh, he actually built debit in the U.S. when no one wanted debit. You know, the people had you know, again it was it was a retail bank mentality and people had checks and it, he played through it and, and he had a lot of scars. So when I started working for him, he spent a lot of time with me, kind of mentoring me and. And, you know, in, in, in the sense, and I've been lucky throughout my career having people like that were willing to invest time and tell me the stories. So I feel like I'm passing it on. But what I learned from him was that you, you got to courage your conviction. So one thing was just, you know, you got to believe and you're going to have to push and you're going to take a lot of heat as you do that. So I mentioned 3D Secure, like that was a big push to, and, you know, push that through. And I ran consumer credit in the U.S. at a time that there was a lot of change. So, so again, having that courage of conviction is one. The second one I learned from an employee of mine, I, I had enough time in the job at Visa where I started to become like the the, the stick in the mud it, because you, you, can, you can really become you know a believer in, well, that's the way we did things. Yeah. You stop asking why. Yep. And this employee that came to work for me was just a classic different thinker. And he used to scare me because he'd say things and I was like, that's not how we do stuff. <laughs> and, and, and I learned through him that A, number one, it's okay to take a meeting. B, it's okay to challenge again uh, the, the, the common point of view. And, and there's a difference between being uncomfortable with someone's ideas versus being scared or taking them as dangerous. Yeah. And, and that's an important line because so many people, when they get challenged on an idea, become defensive and, and stop listening. And the big aha for me was, look, and you see it in this space, right? Is there's a ton to learn, I'm still learning, and just when you think you got it right in this very complex payments world we described, you probably got it wrong. And so, so my advice that I got and I would give to, to your listeners is, look, cha challenge status quo, always ask why, and don't be afraid of the answers you're going to get because, you know what, they may be right. Yeah. And back to your point about change, that's where it comes from. You've got to be willing to listen and accept that your point of view you might be looking at the same object from a different angle. Sure. And, and it served me well. It's, it's amazing, isn't it? We, uh, when you're a little kid getting told, stop asking why, you know, like, uh, but it serves you really well when you get it, older, doesn't I it? I swear. And even here at Thread, you know, I just, the, my first, whatever, four, five, six months, it's where I'm spending my time. You're like, why are we doing it that way? And it's amazing, even a small, relatively small company compared to Visa, it's amazing to see how quickly things get codified as well that's the way we did things and I'm like but why yeah and, and it's very powerful and I keep reminding people I'm not doing that to challenge you but we should be asking ourselves that question because can we do things differently and better yeah yeah I mean decisions are always taken with the variables you've got at the time right and as those change as does everything so, I agree uh, and, and again it's, it, to me it's always about how you look at the same thing and if you've been looking at it one way but never looked around the other side of it it's it, just seeing the problem from a different angle. 100%. Yeah. yeah. Well, thanks very much for joining us, Jim. It's been a great conversation. I mean, definitely we're going to get you guys back to, to talk more as, as the strategy unfolds and, and as do you guys yeah. kind of globally in that sense. But where, where can people learn a little bit more about you and connect with you, but also all of the great work that you guys are doing? Yeah, so uh, obviously on our website, uh, thread.com has all the information. Yeah, you'll continue to see as our products and services evolve um, uh, information there. And obviously if anyone wants to get in contact with me, LinkedIn is... I'm open and available, and I'll answer any and all inquiries. Fantastic. All right, that's uh, sadly all the time that we've got today for, for this episode. It's been a, a great conversation here live at Money 2020, as you probably can hear around us. It's uh, really bustling on the floor and lots of people doing lots of things. If you want to catch up with any of the previous episodes of, of Spotlight, then head over to the 11FS YouTube channel, or if you want to interact with us at all, you can find us on pretty much every social media at this stage. Thank you very much for listening, everybody. Goodbye.